is Kay Siebert, and I am, uh, this morning we are doing Put On Your Own Oxygen Mask First, really the principles of Christ-centered self-care. And it is 8.35 in the morning on February the 18th, 2022. Let's begin with prayer. Father God, I thank you for this day that you've brought us to. And Lord, for the blessing of being able to gather together again face to face. And God, I pray that the words today would not be mine but yours. You know what each one of us, myself included in the room, most needs to hear and know. God, I pray that you also bless the rest of the conference time together, the fellowship, the fun, the laughter, but also, Lord, the equipping and the encouragement. God, we love you and we thank you for your amazing love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So by way of introduction, just for a minute, uh, I am a member here at Christ, so if I am pushing ice cream on you later on today, <laughs> please forgive me now. <laughs> I know how to take a no for an answer. But um, my background and, and what I'm currently doing, I am a registered nurse. I've been one for 35 years. And uh, about the first 27 years of that practice, I was a critical care nurse and, and for 14 and then was a post-anesthesia care nurse for 13, and uh, then actually came here as a school nurse for a few years. In the in-between times, and during that time, about 12 years ago, we as a congregation uh, own a piece of property down at the end of the street that's just south of us here, and it's a it was owned as a medical clinic. And we tried to sublease it until we figured out what to do with the property. And lo and behold, uh, about 18 months later, we still hadn't been able to successfully lease it. At which time, Pastor Jeff said, I was on the board at the time here, and he said, you know, maybe we're supposed to be using it. And I began the exploration process of what was the need in our community and what would that look like. And a couple of years later, we opened Christ Cares Clinic which uh, we opened in, officially opened in early 2012 as a state-licensed um, full-care primary care clinic. All volunteers, our doctors, our PTs, our PAs, our nurses, everyone was a volunteer. We were open a couple of half days a week, and at that time, that was after the economy tanked, right? And here in Arizona, specifically in Maricopa County, where we live, uh, 350,000 people had lost their primary health care. So that was really the need that we formed to meet, but we met it through whole person care. So we had Stephen Ministry, chaplaincy, social work, as well as the medical care on campus, and every patient who came through, and they were coming from the community, not from the congregation, but every patient that came in, that was what we were there to do for them. And we functioned as that for about four and a half years, and then the need decreased. Programs were reopened, and so we went back to the drawing board. And today I'm the director of ministries at what is Christ Cares Ministries. And again, we're just down the street. We have three main ministry arms now. One is called Christ Cares for Kids, which is a, a social ministry outreach to low-income families. We see about 400 families a month. Uh, we're open two days a week, and while they may come through the door for the diapers, the wipes, the baby needs, we also connect them into community services that they may not be aware of. Um, a lot of the families that we serve are undocumented, whether from South America or Mexico or actually Southeast Asia. We have a large Karen population, if anyone's familiar with Thailand, northern Thailand, Burma border. Um, we have a large Karen population here too that actually lives not too far from here. So helping people um, find services that are available to them regardless of their citizenship status. But the most important thing we do, we hope, is um, introduce them to who Jesus is by how we care for them. That's one of the pieces. I'm also now a faith community nurse and um, do one-on-one -on -one and small group care uh, for people who are full-time caregivers and bringing them together and supporting them in what they do every day. And then I'm also, for the last five years, I've been a certified mental health first aid instructor and now travel to churches and schools and other public entities, um, not just here in the West, but I ended up through BPM in Florida two years ago um, also. But teaching 
school staffs, ministry staffs, as well as public organizations and everyday people in every walk of life, mental health first aid. And uh, I will tell you honestly as a nurse, the one thing that I never ever saw myself doing, um, and this is how God works, I never saw myself doing mental health, ever. And he had definite other plans for me, and I can't imagine doing anything else um, as a part of that. But what we're gonna be talking about today is self-care, and but not just self-care, Christ-centered self-care. Because there, there's a lot of um, talk, if you will, these days especially, especially after the last two years of taking care of yourself, but sometimes the motivation behind that or the definition of that or the how do we do that is very much based on values that are different than ours as children of God. And also, sometimes as people in ministry, we're, we're dead last on the list, personally, or we never even make it to our own list of who needs care. Um, so this morning we'll be talking more about why this is important and why this is biblical as well. So I would like to just take a couple minutes, if we could just do a quick pass around the room so that I get a chance to hear who you are and where you're from as well. Maybe where's home, what is your ministry role, or what brought you to best practices, and if you feel comfortable sharing it, what made you pick this session? Okay? So can I start on this thing? Start with you. I'm a pastor's wife. My husband <clears throat> is a pastor in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Okay. And um, I'm also a parochial school teacher at the school, if not at our church. It's downtown. And so I'm on the staff there teaching. And um, it's been a hard year for pastors. <laughs> uh -huh. I live with one. Um, <laughs> and definitely put yourself last. But then also in my teaching staff, I'm one of the older ones. I've been there a long time. But I see in them um, that they're doing things that are unhealthy, both for their physical life and in their marriages. Yep. Uh, we've had one that's had a really hard divorce. I see spouses that are like, going away from the church because they think their teacher spouse is too committed. Yeah. So I'm just struggling with what is the healthy boundary there in doing ministry and yet caring for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. I hope today helps. Okay. I'm Dave Taylor from Redeemer by the Sea in Carlsbad. Okay. And I'm a retired teacher of 36 years history, mostly eighth grade middle school. The oh, God bless day. you. It's the alignment of the planets, how they act, you know, mm -hmm. and such. But, you know, if there's a dialogue that you're going to have today. It's hope for me as a man in Christ. Mm -hmm. Because I know I'm supposed to be an advocate for my family, my wife, and my children first. Sometimes I don't know how to balance that. Right. So that's my question. Yep. And we will talk about that. Thank you. We'll, yep. Good. Mm -hmm. I'm a lay I'm a lay person there, mm -hmm. but active in the ministry. I did junior youth group for thirty years and just recently gave that gave that to someone else to put their stamp on. Uh -huh. Um and I kinda thought this was a good one just for not only for myself but maybe to share with um, our pastor and, mm -hmm. and those in, that are also in the group here. We just you know, on that, you know, uh, something that I know that's concerning to him mm -hmm. um, and everything and so um, I just feel that you know we all need that so that we have to take care of ourselves yeah think, so. yep absolutely good yes I'm Eric Bowman I'm from uh, Corvallis Oregon and uh, I'm a pastor at the church and uh, we started um, a wellness ministry where that's going to be our focus personal group development mm -hmm. Okay. And how you look at this sort of stuff. So that's why. Okay. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. I'm Deb and I'm a caretaker and I just took a call for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I, ha I had my seven o'clock call this morning too. <laughs>
You're kidding. Well, and you talked about that mental health thing, and he teaches freshmen boys men's health and Christian decisions, and I'm going, oh my gosh, I wrote that down. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> Taking calls or you got a rush job and you and it's just the the word's balance. And it's really hard to find that. Oh. Yep. Okay. I think today will help. And my son in law teaches at Lutheran High. I've been there to train their teachers before. Oh you have a good Yeah. Good yeah. Oh, great. And so we did it last year, we're doing it in the coming years. So my husband's a pastor of the church there, and he's been to this, and I have never been to the big one. I've been to the Heartland one. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to see how the big one was run, but specifically this class, because I'm a mom of five, my husband's visually impaired, my daughter's visually impaired, one of them, and so I'm the driver, the caregiver for them all the time. Hopefully it will help. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'm Daniel Potts. I'm the senior pastor at Trinity in Monroe, Michigan. Okay. Um, and I was up at Heartland and got a talk last fall. Um, we have a decent sized staff that we've had legal issues. We've had to let people go. And in the midst of COVID, why not just complicate life? Uh, our other pastor left, and I've got four kids at home, so that's why I'm here. Yep. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> you're you're one of those people that you didn't even make it to the list, right? <laughs> I'm not on that list. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're here. And we'll go across the aisle then. And if you have a vacancy, I'm guessing you're doing a lot more than just worship arts right now, too, right? <laughs> just, just a little. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to fill it in a, an intentional way, right? <laughs> yep.
Okay, good. It's good to see you again. Mm-hmm. to help myself with the limited time that I have have uh, like Christ-centered, productive self-care time. So. Yep. Okay, good. Good. Uh, All right. Go down there. My name is Rachel Gilbrand. I'm a assistant teacher at the pre-K room at a uh, Roman Catholic high school in um, Nevada, New Mexico. And there's just a lot of burnout when you need to reach out to your students and, you know, talking about taking care of yourself and not getting to that point where you need to be with them. Um, I'm Ann Gilbrand. We're sisters. I can so, tell. Um, and I work the same <coughs> place. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. But also just being like, no, that's a lot of transition for me too. And I do need a break because I haven't taken one since July. So. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. I'm glad you're here. Hi, I'm Ruth von Neumann, and um, I have taken the uh, mental health first aid with Kay. Um, I. Uh, a 95 year old mom who had a health crisis last year so I've been flying back and forth between California and here and getting a little frazzled trying to orchestrate things there and get on with what I need to do here and I'm sort of at a crossroads and um, I think I have been putting on my own oxygen mask Yep. And I'm also a retired high school special ed teacher. Wow. Okay, good. 
good to see you. Craig oh. Michelson, senior pastor at Faith Community Lutheran Church and Schools in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, okay. Um, COVID's created a lot of interesting challenges for the church and the preschool and elementary school and, um, and then with all the staff and parents and such. Um, I'm also a durable power of attorney for health care for my father and my sister in Arizona. And the last few years I've spent pretty much all my vacation in hospitals with them or helping them uh, at home. And I'm actually on a leave of absence right now to address their health issues and also some that I now have. So. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you're here. And Tom? Hi. My name is Tom Walter. I'm a deacon at the church in North Scottsdale. Uh, at one time, I was a member of this church. For I five remember years. you. Yeah. Um, I'm taking the class because I know about you and your work, and I knew it would be excellent. And, um, oh, thank you, so Tom. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Glad you're here. Good to see you. Pastor Ryan Key, I work in Depot Reach, and we just, because of COVID, a lot of people are isolating, and we need to help them with uh, self-care, so that's yep. why I'm here. Okay, and last but not least, <laughs> or almost last, we've got one yeah. more, but no, go ahead, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm Jan Dickney, I'm from Rochester, Minnesota, <clears throat> and um, I'm a parish nurse, um, large congregation, and seven day shut-ins that we have, and um, and it's hard, and we preach self-care all the time, <laughs> but, you know, do we do it ourselves? Yeah, that's, it's the, it's the walking, the, walking the talk that we talk is a, not an easy thing to do. We're just doing short introduction, yeah, if you'd like to, yeah, I, yeah. Um, my name is Jennifer Randy, um, I'm a traditional music director at a church in Cleveland, Ohio, and, um, you know, I saw everything going on with the pandemic, and just losing my job, and then my new job, and a lot of self-care. <laughs> mm -hmm. We do. We do. Good. I'm glad you are. And I'm, I'm hoping that I might... There, oh, good. It didn't freeze. Um, and I told you about professional or ministry life. I'm also wife of one, mom of four, and grandmother of ten. And the caregiver for um, was for all four parents. Uh, two now are in heaven with Jesus. And uh, I still have two here that uh, my mother-in-law and my dad that I care for. So, um, yeah, I, and I will tell you before we even start in with the rest of the materials, I'm no expert at this. Um, I may be able to build the framework, but yeah, I get it um, because I'm often that person that's last on the list or I forget to put myself on. I'm getting better, <laughs> but by no means have perfected this process. Okay, um, but if you look up at the screen, you know, if we look at maybe a dictionary type definition of what self-care is, it is defined as a practice of taking an active role in our own well-being. And I love how it terms this, uh, especially in times of stress. Reading that definition alone makes me feel more stressed. How about you guys? Um, but. The thing that I run into as I speak to different groups too about this is I can almost watch the shoulders in the room go up like this, especially if they don't know what I'm going to be speaking about, because there is still a stigma out there that self-care is selfish. And absolutely, it isn't. Um, it, and we'll talk in just a minute about why not, but truly, we used the word balance in the introductions. That really is what a lot of it is about is finding a healthy balance, and that healthy balance is not going to look the same for any two of us. It really isn't because none of us are the same people, none of our lives are the same. But I want you to think about for just a minute, how many roles do you have in life? And as you were introducing yourself, I heard a lot of your roles from you, but think about how many roles do you have in life? You know, if we're married, we have the role of spouse. If we have parents still on earth, we are a child, but probably a responsible child, <laughs> too, for their health and well-being. Um, are we, a, you know, the parent, the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle, the sister, the brother, and then you add all the ministry, the, the occupation, vocation, avocation, all of those other roles in. I'm going to close the door. Oh, somebody did it for me. So we look at our roles, 
And sometimes it's when we look at the, all of the roles that we have, that's when self-care doesn't even make it into our, our framework of thinking. And the thing with our roles is, our roles in life, they're going to be constantly changing. Constantly changing. But what doesn't change truly is, whoops, I went too far, is our identity. Because as redeemed children of God, <laughs> you know, that's our identity. And when we look in God's word at who he says we are, the descriptors of who we are, we are chosen, we are beloved, we're made in his image. He knew us before we ever came to be. I love Psalm 139. Um, we are his workmanship. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, we are his children, dearly loved. We've been sanctified. He takes great delight in his. We belong to him. We are his, and we've been bought with a price. So really, when we talk about Christ-centered self-care, we're talking about taking care of his creation, his dearly beloved creation. And I think that when we start to make that shift in how we view ourselves, first and foremost, before all the roles, before what everybody else needs from us, what does God want from us? What does God want for us also? And so when we are able to look at self-care not as an afterthought, as one more thing to do, but when it becomes not only our mindset, but also our heart set, it becomes a way of life. And, and that's, that's the difference. So let's take a look a little bit more just about what does it mean to be healthy. So what, what do you think it means to be healthy? What do you think? Any ideas? Are we healthy if we, have, if we do not own a, any kind of a diagnosis of any disease process? Does that automatically mean we're healthy? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I will speak personally. I could do way more of some things and less of other things and be a whole lot healthier in many ways. But really, to be, when we're healthy in all ways, we're able to cope with what comes at us in, in a positive way. Um, it, it's about that healthy coping, the being able to handle those day-to-day -day stresses. And when we talk about our health and our well-being, we, aren't, we are a whole being, but there's a whole lot of parts that go into this. So when we look, if you think of it in terms of a wheel, and there's a lot of wholeness wheels out there that are, we'll look at a Christian-based wholeness wheel in a second, but really looking at the parts that make us up um, and that make up our well-being. We have our physical well-being, we have mental well-being, absolutely, spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, and then the ones under there too, and some you can kind of take or leave or combine, occupational. So our occupation, that's what we do to bring home a paycheck. There's a difference between an occupation and a vocation, right? What's a vocation? what we're called to do, yep. And then what's an avocation? That's what we really, really love to do. We might have an occupation that brings home the paycheck, but the avocation is what fills our tank. Okay, both are necessary, and that just depends on, on how our life is structured. But then we have environmental, um, the, the space in which we live is what that one's talking about. We'll break all of these down more specifically. We have community. Who is our support system around us? The interpersonal part of us, as well as financial and intellectual, too. Are we feeding, are we feeding our brain in a healthy way? Um, that's what that one is talking about. And financially, too, just sometimes how we, how we manage what we have can really affect us also mentally, <laughs> emotionally, all of those other things, too. Okay, a different model to look at. And just to let you know, all of this is in, it's on the uh, app, as well as the supplementary things. So the, all of this is there for you. Um, this is the wholeness wheel. This one actually, back in the 90s, there was an inter, uh, interdenominational, interlutheran uh, coalition on health and wellness. 
And this was the, the wholeness wheel that they used when they were looking at health and wellness. And it was specifically targeted towards um, those in active ministry. But this one puts that identity right in the middle and then all of the other parts around this. Um, so there's different ways of looking at it. I posted for you, and I've, I've got extra copies up here if anybody wants a paper copy when you go today. Um, also, this is basically the same thing, but um, I'm not as creative, so I did it in a Word document. This one is copyrighted, so I couldn't copy it for you. Uh, but really, it's looking at the balance of all of that. Now, I have almost all ministry people in the room, right? Okay. So I am just guessing that when we look at the vocational half of your wheel, <laughs> that you might be more like a tire about to have a blowout. <laughs> that, right? that sometimes parts of our wheels get a little hyperinflated and other parts are completely depleted. So again, balance. We get out of balance. But let's take a look at what helps, what some of the parts of this are. Oh, my, my clicker is going a little extra fast. Okay, so what about our physical well-being? What are the things that help to feed into our physical well-being? Um, some of these are going to be like the no-duh kind of things, like healthy diet. Absolutely. That's why I was pushing blueberries out on the patio before we came in. I said, balance out the bacon, okay? But <laughs> not really, but the blueberries were good for you. But do we, do we have a healthy diet? Do we even attempt to? And yeah, it takes time and it takes planning, but that's part of it. Uh, moderate exercise, it's good for us. It's good for all the parts of us. Um, sleep is huge. <laughs> Not much of it happens at BPM for a lot of people, but sleep is super important. How many of you have adolescents at home? Adolescent children. You know, the sleep needs for an adolescent are the same as a toddler. 14 to 16 hours a night, that's a lot. But how many of us get eight or nine hours of sleep a night? Yeah, you get it, huh? Okay. Did you know that sleep deprivation is one of the top cardiac risk factors for you? Not getting adequate sleep. But when you think about it, if we don't get adequate sleep, is our day even, does our day go well? Is our, our head where it should be? Is our heart where it should be? So something as practical as getting enough sleep is a huge part of this. Um, getting, getting in for annual checkups and health screenings. And how many caregivers are in the room? I heard several as you were doing your introductions. You know what? We're the worst at that one. Because whose medical appointments are we always scheduling? Who are we always taking to appointments? Who are we taking physical care of? and we, we may not make it onto the spreadsheet. So that's another piece of that. In addition, um, being compliant with what we're told to do. So if we make it to the doctor and we don't do the things that they advise us to do to be healthier, we're really not helping ourselves, are we? And then also having good, good recreation, um, productive recreation that builds community. These are all things that help our physical well-being. And then we've got our mental well-being. And guess what? Those first ones are all the same ones we just talked about for physical. And really, they apply across the board. Because God did not create us in uh, distinct categories. <laughs> we are a whole person. And when one system is suffering, all of the systems suffer. But when we talk about mental well-being, there's some other things that come into play with that, too, in addition to the things we talked about with physical. And that includes having some important people in our lives that we trust enough to be able to talk with them completely openly. And it's, it's not necessarily a healthy thing to be that open with 50 or 60 people. That's not a good idea. You know, if you think of, of our relationships kind of as ripples, that, that first ripple, those are those people. The people that we feel like we can trust no matter what, we, not only to listen to us and to hold things confidential, but also to give us feedback that maybe are things that are hard for us to hear, 
but we know that they've got our best, our best at heart when they say them, okay? So that's part of our mental well-being, is having someone that we can talk to that we actually do talk to. The flip side of that is, though, how many people are you that inner circle for in your roles? And I'm guessing it's a lot. And sometimes that gets to be a really big burden to carry if we let it, if we let it. Because sometimes when we are carrying so much of everyone else's pain and difficulty and strife, we forget how to be able to separate ourselves from that. And it isn't easy. And there are times when, yeah, I, I get it, you can't. You can't for a time. But we can't continue to carry that with us. While I use the put on your oxygen mask, your own oxygen mask first as the title, and where did I get that from? How many of us fly? You know, and it's so true. But I'll, I'll give you another airline one-liner here too. Your bags fly for free. Your bags fly for free. And how much baggage do we drag along with us through life? Some of that baggage may have come from the time we were this big, and we just continue to carry it. But some of it can also be the burdens that we continue to pick up day after day and take with us. There's a great, how many of you are familiar with skit guys? If you ever have a minute, they have an awesome short skit that's called Baggage. And it's beautifully done, but it also can really hit home. Okay, and good biblical truth in it. Um, supportive friends and family, and that also takes us, again, being open with them and having a balance, finding a balance between our work and our home life. And I, you know, one thing I found, my husband is an engineer, <clears throat> and when COVID hit, by the 1st of April, their offices were all shut down and he was working from home for the first time in 35 years. For us as a married couple, it was the most time we've had together, I mean, day in and day out, the most time we've had together in 35 years. However, what I've seen happening now is that since everybody in the company had their home office, there's only about 25% of them back in the offices now and they're now pretty much, it's assumed that it's 24 seven, that you're available and you can hop on your computer and do this because I need this from you right now. And it's, there's no boundaries left. Now, for those of you that are in ministry, that's probably not, well, I, that is the case anyway, isn't it? It was like that to begin with. But being able to set some of those healthy boundaries. Whoop. Okay, we're gonna talk about what we think about for a minute here. I want you to just, and again, you have all these materials, but I want you to think, just for a minute, think about what you think about. Maybe what are the top five thoughts that are going through your mind on a regular basis? And then think about how do those thoughts make you feel? And how do those feelings, those emotions, affect your behavior? And how do those behaviors affect your relationships? Because truly, when we think about what we think about, there may be some common spirals that we find ourselves going in, some of those circular thought patterns. And especially when you've got a lot of people in your life and you've got a lot of outside influences coming in, um, our thoughts can go from, think about when you make a snowman. You know, you start with a snowball this big and you're rolling it and what happens to it? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, the same thing happens inside our heads too. That sometimes we let some of those things, those thought patterns resonate within us and the more we think about them, the bigger they get and the more overwhelming it gets. And then it really does go on to affect every part of us. There's a great book, um, highly recommend it, and it's, uh, it's called Get Out of Your Head. It's by um, a pastor's wife in Texas. Her name's Jenny Allen. And it's a study of the book of Philippians 
but it also is a lot of brain science into it. But I would highly recommend that one. Um, it's a book written by a woman for women, but guys in the room, I think you would also get a lot out of it. But it really is about how do we, how do we get ahead of that? How do we take captive every thought and make it obedient to God? How do, how do we find uh, work towards the same mindset of Christ? No, we aren't Christ, but how do we work towards having that mindset? How do we stop, intentionally stop when those thought patterns happen? So highly recommend that as, as a resource. It is get out of your head. Mm -hmm. Amazon, about 11 bucks. Mm -hmm. Jenny, J-E-N-N-I-E, -N -N -E, Allen, A-L-L-E-N. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so as a resource, I would really encourage that. But when we think about our thoughts, too, I would also encourage you to think about what you listen to. Um, yeah, are you listening to the news a lot? <laughs> news commentary. Um, other people who like to talk your ear off about certain things that maybe increase your own internal anxiety level. So we have to learn to take care of ourselves by turning some of that off too. Okay, Because what, what we listen to, it affects us. It really and truly does. So we have a lot of control over a lot of those things. Okay, how about emotionally? Well, everything we've already talked about helps us to stay emotionally healthy, but in addition to that, setting some healthy personal boundaries. Um, steering clear of the trap of comparison too. And Pastor Jeff talked about this a little bit last night for those of you who were at the, um, the evening worship service. But comparison is exactly that. It's a huge trap that when we start looking at someone else and either how wonderful their life seems or how hard things must be it we can go we can go places where we really should not be going okay so the more that we and again what does this go back to it goes back to our identity who we are as God's creation and there are no two of us nobody else is going to live the life that God laid out for us and seeing ourselves, looking at ourselves, not by what we think we might lack, again, but by whose we are. And personal boundaries, are those easy things to set? No. Can we change those overnight? No. No. And if we think we're going to change any of this overnight, we're already setting ourselves up to fail. Because it's just not realistic. But emotionally, we just, we need to, the things we've already talked about all build up to try to help with our own emotional health too. And again, some of that is, um, that may be relational too. We can't choose our family, <laughs> can we? But um, who else is in our life that maybe it's just not healthy for us? Some of those relationships that can become more of toxic to our well being. Okay. Then we hit the, the big one for probably most of the people in the room. <laughs> and whether it's occupational or it's vocational, the top one, you know, is your work environment, is it a healthy one? Now, if you first, your first thought is, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm not telling you to leave your job. <laughs> but what can happen? What do you have control over to help it to be a more healthy, bound, uh, healthy place to work? And what are other things externally that could change to help that to be a healthier place? And truly, sometimes it's by setting a better example ourselves and encouraging others to do the same. Are you able to separate yourself from work? And again, in ministry, can you really do that? I think you can, but it takes work. And it also takes being up front with your congregations, your schools too, of, you know, that who, who you are, you know, that you are still first husband or wife, mother or father, before you are pastor. But oftentimes our congregations don't look at it in that way. Um, 
When someone's in crisis, are we going to put them off for a day or two? No, we're not going to. Yeah. But there are times also when other things are not as immediate that we can let some of those things go. And is there that healthy balance between when we're at work and when we're at home? Also a hard one to do, especially if work happens to end up at home. And think about, you know, what are, what are some of the small things that can change in order to help things be a little bit more balanced. And then environmental well-being, and this is, I'm not talking about recycling here. <laughs> I am talking about the, um, the environment in which we live, and maybe it might be the environment in which we, we work, too. <coughs> but um, what is our home environment like? And I, I had um, a lady in one of my mental health classes a couple of months ago who we were working because self-care is a big part of that too. We were talking through this and it happened to be a half, half day and half day class. So we had a week between. And she said what she, I sent them home with homework to work on this. And she said the one thing that she realized was if she took five more minutes in the morning before she left for work, made the bed, loaded the dishwasher, <laughs> closed the cabinet doors, you know, just kind of put stuff where it needed to be. Five more minutes was all it took that when she walked in the door at night, she felt completely differently than she did on the days when everything looked like a bomb had gone off when she came home that night. Because when she would walk through the door at night when it looked like that, she was feeling badly about herself. She'd get you know, upset with not only herself, but just looking at the mess. It set her off. But that's, that's an example of just one of those little things that we can do in our own home environment if we tend to be, and if some of you have four or five kids, yeah, it's, it's busy when you're trying to get out the door in the morning. But let me tell you, it makes a huge difference when you come home at night. Then your home's that sanctuary where you want to be. Um, so anything else that you could think of for your home environment, even your work environment? Are there any things that pop to your mind, <coughs> changes that could happen? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Having a window in your office, if you can. <laughs> Things like that. Yep, plants is great. Um, yep, so there are, there are a lot of small, and again, each one of us is a different person. So what speaks to our heart and soul is going to look a little bit differently. OK, how about the social and the interpersonal part of us? And for the, all of you who are in ministry, you are a social and an interpersonal person. Um, but. Think about who is a part of your, you know, what are the layers of relationship that you have within your communities? And as I mentioned just a minute ago, are there some of those relationships maybe that aren't real healthy? Some that, that maybe you need to step back from and separate yourself from. And then we've got family too. Now, we don't have any control over who we're related to. But you know what? Sometimes we do have a need to take some control over how much we let those relationships affect us. Um, our role is never to fix somebody. <laughs> um, we can oftentimes be the bridge to someone getting the help that they need, depending on what is going on. But if we carry that role that we are supposed to make everybody be better, it's not healthy for them and it's not healthy for us. And sometimes even within our own families or extended families, we need to take a step back. Um, when we have adult children who may be struggling with addiction, um, with other things that, uh, that they now need to take ownership of, things that we cannot possibly fix for them, those can absolutely destroy a marriage and destroy a family. And finding support for ourselves outside of that, um, whether it's a PAL support group, a NAMI support group, um, and statistically, that's one in every four of us that either are right now experiencing that or will be experiencing that. 
but taking care of us again so that when they need us to be present, we can be. Um, and sometimes we are connected maybe a little bit too closely. Sometimes we're not connected enough. And I would, I would just guess for those of you that are pastors in the room, sometimes it's hard to find that inner ripple of people that you can trust outside of your family that to really be open and honest with. Um, because people sometimes look at you differently, think you've got to have it all together. You must know it all. And each one of us, we put our pants on one leg at a time, don't we? And there's no demographic for when we're talking about some of these things. There's, you know, well, the demographic is everybody. All of us are in the same boat together. And who do we go to for help? And do we feel like we can? Okay. And then the spiritual well-being piece. And um, for those of us that are in full-time ministry, that, this is not what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. This is personal walk time. This is personal worship time, time in the word, time in prayer. And when the day starts off that way, I'll tell you personally for me, when I take that time in the morning, my day is completely different. And I don't do it enough <laughs> that there are still days when I'm flying out the door. But you know what? Makes, it makes my day completely different. And oftentimes I find then that my day is not what I thought my day was going to be. That I am more open and ready for the divine appointments that God may be making for me that I had no idea were on my schedule for that day. But if I don't start the day with the right mindset and heart set, and I, I'm not talking an hour, <laughs> you know, but even if there is 15 or 20 minutes that we can set aside that that's just time that we're in the word, that we're in prayer, and that we are personally, privately, intimately with God. Okay? All right. So one of the things I posted on the, on the app some things for you. And one of them, um, it'll look like this. I just had a single copy. This is a study that I wrote actually for a school in um, Fremont, California halfway through COVID um, for their teaching staff, but it's all about rest. And there's some questions, there's some scriptural references, so that's for your use, if you would like to, on the, the documents. But the one that is the self-care plan, um, and I do have extra copies if you wanna take one of these with you today, looks like this. And it is, um, I've got all the different categories on there, and how I would, encourage you to use this is that you look at each one of those areas and think about okay what am I doing now that helps me to be healthy in this area and then what am I maybe doing now that really is adversely affecting how healthy I am in this area look at it that way and then think about okay what is one small step I can make to be healthier in this way. So if we take physical, um, even if we get out for 15, 20, 30 minutes a day for a walk, you know how beneficial that is? Not just for us physically, but it's beneficial for us mentally, emotionally, spiritually. When I go walk, that, that's prayer time when I walk. But just doing that one thing ticks almost every one of those boxes. And if we can do it in the middle of a work day, <laughs> say, I'll be back in 30, and we go and do that, uh, I will guarantee you your afternoon will be better than your morning was probably. Okay, so that's one small step. But as you look at each one of those areas, I encourage you, and, and again, no two care plans are going to look the same, but think of small things that you can do and start to make a part of your everyday life. But I also would encourage you this. We've all got our list of to-dos. You can't just add this to it, okay? Kind of need to look at the list of to-dos and think, okay, what really belongs on here and what could come off of this? 
because the last thing I want for self-care to be is one is to add more stuff to do. And how you do this is that self-care becomes not an afterthought, not the one more thing to do, but again, how do, am I living my life in all ways? How am I taking care of myself? And I'll, I'll tell you honestly, one of the things that I have found most effective for me is when someone asks me to do something, I now actually stop and think instead of reacting immediately with a yes. It took me a long time to learn that little word called no. Um, and I usually couch it with something in addition to no. But um, really thinking about, is this something I have the physical or emotional, mental or spiritual bandwidth to be committing to right now? Or is there someone else who probably is in a better position right now to be able to do this? So it's, if it's a no, it's a no but, okay? But really starting to, to think before we speak when it's in terms of adding more things onto our plates, if you will. Um, Ecclesiastes 3, for me also, was a really, really good tool to use. And this is what I did with it. Um, and this is the, I'm guessing everybody in the room is very familiar with this passage of scripture. But what I did with it a couple of years ago was I rewrote it for me. And you think, if you look at how that is framed, talking about a time for this and a time for that, and personally spending some time with that scripture and then thinking, okay, how does this apply to my life right now? What is it time for me to uproot? And what do I feel the Holy Spirit leading me to plant? Okay, those types of things. Um, a time to tear and a time to mend. We're talking about relationships there. Okay, that sometimes that separation, that's the healthiest thing we can do. But sometimes there's unforgiveness over here that's in here and in here that is not helping us be healthier that we need to go do something about. Okay? So this is another tool that I would encourage you um, to use. And I'm not gonna, I am not going to keep you for the whole, the whole time today. But as we get ready to close, and we'll have some time for discussion if you, you would like to, but, and this one did not show up really well up there, so I will read it to you. This is why it matters. These are the reasons why it matters. God loves us with a love that absolutely never gets tired. No matter how exhausted, how depleted we are, um, he's, he never tires. He never, never tires. And God is at work in you. He's at work on you. And he's at work through you all of the time. God is, or excuse me, you are God's way of doing things here on earth. Um, Jesus was skin on, if you will, but we are how he accomplishes through the Holy Spirit, his work on earth here. Prayer works. <laughs> Amen. Prayer works. And God wants to spend his days with you. Not only wants to, God does spend his days with you, but how often are we really aware of that? Yeah. He is never far from us, but sometimes we feel that we are farther from him. But I hope that this has been helpful. And like I said, the tools that are also on the, um, on the site are there for you. Any questions, comments as we start to close this morning? Mm-hmm. Going back to uh, sleep and sensual and... Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's usually where it starts. Mm -hmm. And then some days it's like I'm working all day, and then if I go to sleep when I should go to sleep, I never have any time to do anything that makes me happy. Not that my work is right. happy. Right. Right. Something recreational. But the, the things that fill you up. And again, it's that piece of finding the balance. So maybe you do half an hour of happy and you get a half an hour more sleep. <laughs> yeah, so again, it's, it's the, yeah, um, it, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Um, and we may tell ourselves that we can catch up on sleep or bank sleep, but guess what? It does not work that way. <laughs> that, that's not reality. Um, but maybe trying to find that happy medium 
and, and two, looking at, okay, because you, you teach, plus you do music, plus you have a family, right? Transitioning out of another job that I had, which actually, and the occupational, vocational well-being, I Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, more of like secondary teaching style that I have. Yeah. So I think that actually some of this will kind of resolve itself, but in the meanwhile, um, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of irons and a lot of fires. Mm -hmm. And there are seasons, just like Ecclesiastes, there are seasons. So there may be seasons where there's more of that, but then as we move forward, and if you're in transition, then intentionally <laughs> making, when you can, making time to be able to do that. Because when we get totally depleted, are we any good to anybody? No. no, we're really not. And that's really what this is about, that if we're running on fumes or less, we are, we are not going to be as observant, as empathetic, and as effective with the people that we're ministering to. Because we're, we're not going to be on, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so um, as I said, everything is posted in the documents on the app, but my, you can get a hold of me through that too. So um, please feel free to if you need to. Those on. That is like oh, you're welcome. No, because I just I think it's good to be able to go back to them yeah. later on and to have that resource. So I want you guys to have that. But okay, well, God's blessings. Um, there's probably more bacon outside. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And I do have copies. If anybody wants a paper copy of the self-care plan, I do have that up here. Please help yourself. So, Daniel Vanderhyde. Oh, my gosh. I'm Jess's mom. Who's mom? Jess. Daniel is my oldest child. But he's the oldest. Mm -hmm. So we go way back. When they first came to Denver, they came to our church. Mm -hmm. And he was teaching at the old Lutheran like Dan David was. Right. Jim yeah. said, yeah. And then my husband, he decided to leave teaching for a while. My husband helped him get a job at the company he was working at. Then he went.